Kia ora and welcome to my last Tuesday prose reading for the year. Today I'm going to read an extract from The Runaway Settlers. The Runaway Settlers was written by Elsie Locke. This was her first novel and it was published in 1965. Elsie Locke was a writer and she was a leading activist in New Zealand. So the chapter I'm reading from is called A Place to Put Your Foot. In the bush that lined the shore, the bellbirds were singing loudly while two wood pigeons, stuffed fat with fuchsia berries, sat lazily on a branch. A track sloped towards the beach. Emma ran ahead with shouts of joy and danced on the sand. Shells were piled in ridges just beyond the tide. She picked them up by handfuls and flung them far and wide. When she came to the little stream trickling into the sea, she felt it with her bare toes, gasped, ooh, and splashed on. Ooh, she cried again in a voice high with excitement. Chuk, chuk! Two brown birds like overgrown chickens stalked out of the bushes to peck around among the dry seaweed. Emma fussed about trying to catch them. But the Weckers did not mind in the least, as they were always a few steps ahead. Jack's eyes turned to the harbour, watching the circles where fish had leaped. They would really be worth the catching. He wondered where the boat had gone. Then he heard Emma. Ooble, ooble, water, booble. Ooble, ooble, water, booble, she sang. Yes, water was bubbling, sure enough, right where she was sitting on a green bank above the sand. Jack lifted her down and she stopped singing long enough to say, Ooh, cold, and shake out the wet hem of her dress. She reached out her hands again to catch the bubble, a clear, delicious spring tumbling out into a hollow which someone had smoothed to hold a billy or a pannikin. Sedges reached across the little pool since its, ma since its makers had left. Come, Emma, let's tell Mother we've found fresh water. Ooble, ooble, water, booble, sang Emma all the way up the beach. They found Mrs. Phipps with her long sandy hair already brushed and twisted into a bun, busy laying an outdoor fire. I can't test the chimney until everyone is up, she said, and if they're asleep on the hard ground, it's sleep they need. The day was solid work. Water was carried and a tripod built over the fire. Mr. Dyer came early with his pack bullock, bearing all the remaining bundles, an axe and a spade and a billy of beautiful fresh milk. You must come to me if you're short of anything you need, he said, or to the other cottage. I'll show the lad where to find it. I'm Jack, said the lad promptly. Beg your pardon, Jack. I couldn't sort you all out last night. About the next cottage, that's where Mrs. Parsons lives. She's my sister, and Charles Parsons shares the farm with me. I don't doubt we'll all be good neighbours. We're much obliged to you, Mr. Dyer, said Mrs. Phipps. I trust we shall be the same. Can I go with Mr. Dyer now? asked Jack eagerly. And no breakfast? I'll soon be back, he promised. Mrs. Phipps made hot bread and milk in the billy, and Jack, true to his word, was home before his sleepy brothers had finished eating. It was time to examine the hut. There was a petition at one end, which had appeared in the lamplight to be the end wall. In that tiny bedroom was a second calico window and two more bunks, made of nothing better than fork stakes driven into the ground to support saplings and a nest of small branches. The sacking which covered them was chewed by the rats and the mesh was broken in many places. The open fireplace took up all one end of the kitchen with chains and hooks for the billies and iron bars on which to rest the pans. There was no furniture except for boxes and packing cases. All the quicker for cleaning, said Mrs Phipps. She had everyone running in and out until the hut was quite bare and all the litter swept into the fireplace. Dry twigs were piled on top, the fire was lit, the green leaves were thrown on to the blaze to make plenty of smoke. Mrs Phipps and the boys watched keenly for any wisp of smoke coming out in the wrong places. 
but no, the high chimney carried it all clear of the thatch. Small though it was, the hut was completely sound. The rat holes along the earthen floor had to be stopped up with stones. As for the roof, a few patches of thatch needed renewing, and this had to be done with tussock, which was not handy to find. So Jack and Bill, who had thought they were free of flax cutting, were sent again to the gully to fetch flax and toy toy for temporary repairs. Archie and Mrs Phipps took out the axe and cut a pile of strong, supple branches to mend the bunks. There was no sacking to be found, but in the gully there was a mass of vine with dry, springy stalks, which was as good as a wire mattress. The blankets were aired and shaken and laid neatly on top. Now the boxes were soused in the tide to cleanse them of insects and dried out in the sunshine before being arranged for tables and chairs and shelves. Jack sat cross-legged on the ground, plaiting one flax rope after another and enjoying the work. The ropes were slung across and along the room to carry clothes and other belongings, for there were no cupboards or drawers. Pots and pans, cups and plates, all had to be arranged. A place for everything and everything in its place, said Mrs Phipps. In the midst of it all danced Emma, bent on finding the, bless, the best place for Bibi, but each time the doll had to make way for something else. So Jack made her a tiny flax hammock and hung it in the corner. Lullaby, bye, bye, crooned Emma as she swung the doll in the hammock happily to and fro. At last Mrs Phipps surveyed the room and could think of only one more thing to be done. She took out her own treasure, the Toby jug that had been a wedding present. Who will find me some flowers? You, Jim? Me, me, cried Emma. She did not know enough words to explain, but she had seen flowers down near the spring. Off she ran, with Jim after her. Yes, there was a bush covered with purple pink spikes, the Koromiko. Emma was in such a hurry, she would have pulled every flower off short if Jim had not been there to make sure of the, long, the good long stalks. Why, it's like a bottle brush, said Mrs Phipps, very pleased, only there's no handle coming out at the end. She set the Toby jug full of flowers on the window ledge, and the house became a home. That's all for now. I'll see you in the new year. Bye.